We're starting a brand new series this morning called The Harvest. And we're looking at this idea, this concept that God wants to use you, yes, you, not the person sitting next to you, not the person across the street or who lives in a different country or state. No, God wants to use you to do incredible work. He's called you, he's equipped you, and now we get to go and do the work that he's set before us. So in this series, what we're looking at is what has God called us to do and how do we go and do it. And I think this is going to be a challenging and encouraging message for all of us to step into whatever it is that God has for us. We'll dive into that in a minute, but first I just want to ask you a question. What was your first job? What was your first job? Maybe you can comment that down below, leave that in the comments and let us know what your first job was. My first job was a lifeguard and I lifeguarded at the city of Longmont in Colorado and I started that pretty soon after I turned 15. Now, I knew I wanted to be a lifeguard for, for years prior to that. Uh, and, and so at age 14, when you could start taking some of the classes and getting some of the preparation, I started doing that because I really wanted to be a lifeguard. And I wanted to be a lifeguard for two reasons. One, it paid $3 an hour more than minimum wage. And that was a lot of money to 15-year-old me. And the second reason that I wanted to be a lifeguard was I thought it would be like just like it is in the movies in the TV shows. You know, where you sit up on your stand, you get a great tan, and when it's convenient for you, somebody starts drowning, and you get to stand up and do that heroic jump off of the stand into the water, and everyone kind of gathers around as you swim over to this person in distress, and you pull them out, and you put them back on safety, and everyone's like cheering and chanting your name, and you like walk away in slow motion, and your lifeguard girlfriend comes up, and you walk away together. And this is what I thought it would be like to be a lifeguard. Now, it turns out, there's nothing like that. It's nothing like that. The job actually included hours of watching other people have fun. Watching other people play and splash in the pool. It included yelling at kids, which that part was kind of fun. It included lots of cleaning. Nobody told me how much cleaning was involved in being a lifeguard. And sometimes you even have to scoop up like floaties from the pool. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, that part was really gross. Nobody told me about that in the interview process. That's not what I pictured it to be. And occasionally you had to deal with angry people who didn't obey the rules. And you got tired of telling them over and over and over again what to do and what not to do. And they get angry at you. It also included <clears throat> random tests to make sure that we were up to par, that we could do our job. Uh, and, and then a few times a year when you did have to jump in and save somebody, there's nobody that would gather around to cheer you on. There's no slow motion walks away. You weren't allowed to date other lifeguards, so I didn't have a lifeguard girlfriend like I thought I would. The job was nothing like I thought it was, but I still loved it. And I learned some important lessons. Maybe. The most important lesson that I learned as I was a lifeguard was that I represented the city of Longmont. I represented the rec center. What I did, what I didn't do, how I treated others, how I did my job, how I took things seriously or not seriously, it had a larger impact than just me. What I did affected the city. It affected the rec center. What I did, people would look at me and they wouldn't necessarily see me. They would see the city. They would see the rec center. You see, when I went in for a rescue and I successfully pulled somebody out from drowning, it wasn't really me that looked good. It was the city. People would look at the team. They'd look at the lifeguards. They'd look at the rec center. They'd look at the city of Longmont and say, wow, they are doing their job. This city, this rec center prioritizes our safety. I represented the city. And when a few lifeguards at one point were caught smoking pot and drinking on the job, yes, they were fired. They didn't just look bad themselves. It caused us, the whole team, all the lifeguards. It caused the city to look bad because they were representing the city. And even the rec center took this seriously. They were to remind us that we're part of a team, that we're part of something bigger. This isn't an indiv individual thing. This is something that we're all a part of. And they would test us. Every five or six months, they would send somebody in the pool to, to cause a problem, to drown, to get a fake injury. 
And then they would watch us from a distance on how we responded, how we uh, cared for them, what we did. And, and then afterwards, they would come up and they'd correct us for the things we got wrong. And if we outright failed, they could fire somebody on the spot for not doing their job because they knew the goal, the mission of this team was important. See, this job taught me the importance of working on a team and represented them well. It showed me that my actions, my words, what I did or didn't do had ramifications far beyond me. You see, I was part of something larger than myself. I was a representative of the city. Now, my guess is all of you have had a job. You've been a part of an organization. You've joined a team, a club, or whatever that is bigger than yourself. And that team that you were, that you are a part of, has a role to play, a job to do, and you play a role in that. You maybe if you work for a company, your job is to write a newspaper, to sell a product, to make money, to help people, to scoop ice cream, to make ice cream, to sing a song, to play a game, to win the game. See, when you're a part of a team, when you're a part of an organization, when you're a part of a company, you are playing a role in what the larger organization is trying to accomplish. And what you do in your job, what you do on your team, what you do in your organization has a larger impact than just you. If you decided to show up tomorrow to work and to treat all the customers you interact with poorly, you're gonna cuss them out, you're gonna insult them, you're just gonna stare at your phone, you're not gonna pay any attention to them, it's not just gonna look bad on you, although you probably will be fired. It's gonna look bad on the company as a whole, right? I mean, when you walk into a restaurant or when you walk into a store or when you go to a business to get some kind of product or whatever and the people there treat you poorly, you don't just think badly of that person. You think badly of that company. You're like, well, I'm not going to get my insurance from them. I'm not going to buy this product from them. I'm going to go to the one across the street because they treat me nice over there. This company doesn't respect me. This company doesn't help me. This company doesn't care about me because the employees there aren't just showing badly on themselves. They're representing the company. And the same is true for all of us that are a part of a team. Whenever we join a team, we become part of something bigger than ourselves. When we put on that uniform, when we put on that jersey, when we show up to work, we're representing the organization, the company, the team that we're there for. And when people outside your team, people outside your company, people outside your organization see you, they're going to make assumptions, good, bad, or otherwise, about your company, about your team, about your organization based on how you act based on what you say, based on what you do, or based on what you don't do. They're gonna make, they're gonna make uh, assumptions, not about you necessarily, but about your company. And here's the point. And yes, there's a point to all of this. Just as you are representative of the teams that you're on, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are also his representative. And this is important, don't miss this. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you are following Jesus, if you say, I'm a Christian, I'm in, what you do, what you say, how you treat those around you, how you interact with the world, tells the people in your life something about Jesus. Good, bad, or otherwise, how you treat people as a follower of Jesus, what you say, what you don't say, what you do, what you don't do, tells them something about who Jesus is. And there's people whose only perception, whose only understanding of Jesus is what you say. You are, you are God's representative. Here's how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says this, So, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We no longer do so. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to Christ, himself and Christ, not counting people's sin against them. 
And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We'll continue this in just a minute, but I think it's important to pause here and look at what Paul, who wrote this passage, is saying about our transformation uh, in Christ. Paul is telling the readers and us today that he's a new person. He used to view the world this way. He used to view God this way. He used to view Jesus this way. And now Christ has entered his life, and now he views things this way. There's been a fundamental shift, a fundamental change in his life. The old is gone and the new has come. And listen, Paul was one messed up dude. I mean, he was born as Saul. And what he did in his young adult life was he went town to town persecuting Christians, putting them in jail, beating them up, and even killing them. This is what he did. That was his life, was killing Christians. He was not a great dude. And then one day he's on this road to another town to do the same things that he's been doing for a long time. And Jesus appears to him, like literally Jesus appears to him. He says, Saul, what are you doing here, buddy? And Saul goes, who, who are you? It's like, uh, I'm, I'm Jesus. You know, the one who you've been killing his followers. Yeah, that, that's me. And in that moment, Paul is living his old life and he encounters Jesus. And instead of finding condemnation, instead of Jesus beating him down, which, let's be honest, he deserved, Jesus offers him grace and forgiveness and invites him to be a part of his team. And Paul leaves his old life behind and he steps into the new creation, the new life that God has for him. Now, instead of going from town to town persecuting Christians, he goes town to town telling people about what God has done for him. And that's what he's alluding to in this, this first passage that we just looked at. He's saying, the old is gone and the new has come. I'm a new person. God's made me new. He's done something incredible in my life. And listen, just in that moment as Paul's whole life changed, the same offer is true for us today too. When we follow Jesus, a new creation comes in. The shame and the guilt and our mistakes and our sins that were in our past life, they no longer have to weigh us down. We can step into this life that God has for us that's full of peace and joy and love that's not rooted in our circumstances, but rooted in Jesus. The old is gone and the new has come. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is what he's giving you. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this is what he's offering you. It's true for you just as it was true for Paul. And listen, if it can be true for Paul, the guy that went around murdering Christians, if it's true for that guy, surely it can be true for you and for me. God has an incredible life for you that you can step into. So, Paul's not done yet. He continues on and he says, because, because of all that has happened, because the old is gone and the new has come, here's now what we should do. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Because of what God has done for us, we are now therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Step into the new that he has for you. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. The word ambassador here means uh, to be an ambassador like what we would think of, but it also means to be a messenger, an errand uh, doer. It means that we're carrying crucial or critical news to the world around us. What Paul is saying, he's saying God has done all this stuff for us. He's forgiven us. He's let us step into the freedom that he has for us. And now, therefore, because of that, we are God's ambassadors. And what's the message we're taking? We're taking the message that God has eliminated the old and brought in the new. He's eliminated the bad and gave us something good. And if that's true for us, it's also true for the people around us. If that's true for Paul, a murderer of Christians, then it's true for all of us as well. That God has something incredible for each person. We, followers of Jesus, are tasked with taking that good news. With being God's, being God's ambassador, his representative to those around us. And the reality is the way that we treat others, the way that we treat others either pushes people toward Jesus or pushes people away from Jesus. The way that we take this responsibility that God has given us to be his ambassadors is either going to push people towards Jesus or away from him. And I want you to think about that for a minute. 
I want you to think about that for a minute. How are you doing being God's ambassador? What would people know about Jesus based on how you live? Based on what you say? Based on how you treat them? How you interact with others? What would people know about Jesus based on your life? And listen, I don't say that as a threat. Like, you better do this. You better do this or else Jesus is going to like kick you out. He's going to be angry with you. No, no, no. I don't say this as a threat. I say this as an opportunity. You don't have to be God's representative. You get to be God's representative. I mean, think back to the first job you got. Think back to the time you got accepted onto that team. Maybe you got varsity for this first time. Think back to the time you got that role in the play or that solo in the concert. How'd you feel? When you got that call that you got your dream job? How'd you feel when you got the call that you got the part? That you were accepted on the team? How did you feel in that moment? My guess is you were pretty excited. You couldn't wait to put on that jersey. You couldn't wait to show up for work. You couldn't wait to be a part of that team or that organization. Because you went out of your way to train, to prepare, to apply for, to get that job. You've been trying to do it for so long. My guess is when you finally got there, you were excited. You didn't have to join that team. You didn't have to play basketball. You didn't have to go after that job. You chose to because you wanted to be a part of that team. And my guess is you were excited when you finally got in. See, the same is true for following Jesus. Jesus has never forced and he never will force anybody to follow him. He's given us an invitation. He's given us the opportunity to follow him. And when we accept that invitation, we get to step into this new life that he has for us. But he's not going to force us. He's not going to force anybody. He's given us the opportunity to step into it. When we willingly step into that life with Jesus, we become his ambassadors. We're not forced to. We get to. And just as when we finally made the basketball team, we probably didn't hide our jersey. No, we probably ran it out and shouted it from the rooftops that we made the team. And the same should be true in our relationship with God. We should be excited that God has accepted us onto his team. So I don't say any of this as a threat or to guilt you into being God's ambassadors. I say this as an opportunity. We get to represent Jesus. That's an incredible opportunity and responsibility that we get to be a part of. I love how Jesus kind of explains this idea of being his ambassador in Matthew chapter 5. He says this, you are the light of the world. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are the light of the world. A city on a hillside cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and then put it under a basket. They put it on a stand and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who's in heaven. I think these words accurately depict how many of us live our lives. We have this incredible hope in Christ, this light, this light in a dark, dark world. And what do many of us do, myself included, is we hide it, put it under a basket. We're too ashamed. We don't want other people to know. We're afraid of what they might say or what they might think or that we might lose some relationship. So we keep this light that's desperately needed. We keep it hidden so others can't see. And listen, I get that. I've been there. I've been at that place where I've hidden my light because I'm afraid of what others might think or what others might do or how others might treat me. And what I found in those moments, what I need to do is I need to shift my perspective. See, I get so concerned about what those around me might think rather than looking at what Jesus and what he's called me to do. I need to shift my focus so I can look at what God's called me to do so I can keep pursuing his mission to look at the purpose he's given me and not worry about the consequences, but worry about following Jesus well. That doesn't make it easy, but it does help me keep things in perspective. Another thing I think we should notice about this passage in Matthew chapter 5 is the manner in which Jesus tells us to shine our light. He tells us to put it on a table, to put it on a lampstand. Not to shine it in people's faces. 
You've probably been at churches or around Christians that do that, right? They take it like those really powerful flashlights and they shine the light of Christ in people's eyes, like blinding them. And they're really aggressive about it. You know, kind of like that turn or burn mentality, like you better follow Jesus or else. And they're just shining this light and they're using it like as a weapon. But that's not what Jesus tells us to do. See, we're not supposed to hide our light. We're also not supposed to blind people with it. No, what do we do? We set it on our table. We make it visible. And we let it give light to those around us. That means we don't hide what God is doing in our life. We don't hide that we're no longer this old person anymore. We show people that we're new that we have a new life, that we're living in freedom and peace and joy. We tell people about what God has done for us, not in an aggressive manner, but in a loving, caring manner. Just like you wouldn't hide a light in a dark house, nor should we hide the light that Christ has given us with our neighbors and our coworkers and our family and our friends. No, we should let it shine so they can see the life change and transformation that's happened in us. And we're going to talk more about this in the coming weeks, about what this actually is and how we actually do this. But really what I want us to wrestle with right now is how are we representing Jesus? How are we shining our light? Are you hiding it in a basket? Are you being aggressive with it and pounding people with the truth that you have in Christ? Or are you putting it on the table so that the world can see the life change that God has given you? Again, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into this in the coming weeks, but I really want us to wrestle with this idea of representing Jesus because the picture people have of Jesus in your life, the understanding of who he is and what he's come to do is based off what you do, what you say, and how you treat those in your life. You are God's representative. You are his ambassador. And here's what I believe about you. I believe you are in a unique spot. You are in a unique spot to make an impact on somebody in a way that nobody else can. I believe God has uniquely gifted you, equipped you. He's given you skills and he's given you passions to make an impact on somebody in a way that nobody else can. You are his ambassador. You are his representative and your charge is to go to those people and to tell them about what Jesus has done for you. And listen, I know that there's a bunch of fears and what ifs. I have those two. What are they going to say? What are they going to do? But remember, when that happens, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We need to remind us that he has uniquely gifted and, and equipped us to go to those people. And I know one of the biggest fears that we often have is, what if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? What if they have something going on in their life that I can't fix? I just want you to know it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know, but here's what I do know. I was this way and now I'm this way. I might not know the answer to your question, but what I found is God has been so good. He's been so loving. He's been so caring. He's given me such purpose and meaning in my life. And I believe the same is true for you. Listen, God has not called you to have all the answers. He's called you to shine his light. And there might come a time where you don't have the solution. You don't have the answer and that's okay. God's not called you to memorize every single objection and every single answer. He's just telling you to love the people around you, to shine his light to the world around you. Let me end by giving you two questions that I I think will be good for you to ponder, good for you to wrestle with, that will help you be a better representative of God to those in your life. The first question is this, who's around me? Who's around me? Who's in your life? Who do you walk by every day? Who do you sit next to every day at work? Who do you interact with? Who do you play sports with? Who's around me? Who's around me? you. And my guess is you don't have to go very far. There are people in your life that you see, that you interact with, that you are in a unique spot to make an impact on that nobody else can. So who's around you? And my guess is when you hear that question, a few faces start popping in your head. 
You start thinking about, oh, yeah, I see this person. I see him. I see her. I see them every day or I see them every Wednesday night or I sit next to them when our kids play soccer or I, I, I eat lunch with them at work or, or I play basketball with them on the weekend, whatever it is. You're, there's people around you. So who's that person for you? Who's around me? And the second question is this. What do they need that I can provide? What do they need that I can provide? See, this doesn't mean you have to give every dollar. No, what do, you, what do they need that you can provide? Maybe they need like a new car. And you can't even afford a new car for yourself, let alone your neighbor. You don't have to worry about that. What do they need that you can provide? And often what I've found is it's often smaller things than we think. People often, they just need some help at work. They just need somebody to invite them over for dinner and drinks and to talk about life. They just need some help moving. They just need some help doing something. They just need somebody in their life that genuinely cares about them. They just need a golfing buddy. Somebody to help them fix their car. So what do they need that you can provide? What I love about these questions is that they're simple. Who's around me? What do they need that I can provide? They're simple. But they cause us to look outside of ourselves. See, we tend to get so focused on ourselves and what we have going on that we neglect what's happening around us. And these questions cause us to stop, look at who's around us, and look at how we can represent God by meeting their needs. And here's my challenge for you. Here's my challenge. To think about these questions and then come up with three names. Come up with three people in your life. And I'm going to encourage you to write them down. We have these cards that are called the top three cards. And you can write down the names on these cards. And then below that, you can, uh, there's some just prayer prompts that you can be praying for these people in your life. And you can download this, this card. It will be linked in the description. You can download the PDF and print it off. And you can write it down yourself. Or if you're not a paper person, that's fine. You can write it in the notes section on your phone. But I, I do want to encourage you to actually write these names down somewhere. Write these names down and commit to praying for them. Pray for them regularly. You don't have to pray for them for hours, but spend a minute or two each day on your drive into work, as you're getting ready in the morning in the bathroom, put the list on your mirror so you can just remember to pray for these people because God has given you a purpose and he's equipped you and placed you in a place to make an impact on these people in a way that nobody else can. So commit to pray for them. Pray for these people regularly because we have no idea what God can do and will do through us when we step into being his ambassadors. So I'd encourage you, take some time today, write these names down and commit to praying for them. Commit to praying for them because if you do these things, if you ask these questions, if you write those names down, we are going to be well on our way to representing Jesus well. We're going to be well on our way to shining God's light in a dark and hurting world. We'll take our next step in our faith as we live it out to those around us. So take some time, write those names down and commit to praying for them because you are in a unique spot to make an impact on somebody in a way that nobody else can. So represent Christ well. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that the old in our life is gone and the new has come. God, we thank you that you've given us this incredible hope and joy and peace. And God, I pray that we aren't a people that keeps that to ourselves, but we are a people that places the light on the table for the world to see. And God, I pray that right now, that you would pop three names into each of our heads of people that we can reach, people that we can pray for, people that you have put in our lives for a reason. God, I pray that you put those names on our hearts and that you remind us to be praying for these people regularly. We thank you, God, that you have included us in your plan and your kingdom, and we pray that you give us boldness to step into what you have for us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.